Hello everyone, welcome to another class on the course on quantum field theory of many body systems in condensed matter. Uh, my name is Luis Gregorio Diaz and in today's class we're going to cover mean field theories and uh, we'll first review uh, how to write interacting systems in second quant quantization and then we're going to introduce the mean field approach, mean field approach and what does it mean? Uh, we're going to start with a more simple case of two sets of non-identical particles uh, interacting with each other. And then we're going to move on to the case of identical interacting particles. And in particular, we're going to uh, talk about uh, the case of interacting fermions and how does the mean field approach leads to the so-called Hartree-Fock approximation, which is very, very important in the field. All right, so let's start the class. Okay, so let's start with the non-interacting systems in second quantization, and we cover that in a class, the second quantization formalism, and how to write uh, single particle operators in, in, in this uh, formalism or n particle operators as well and so let's remember that if you have a single particle a, a, a n particle operator which is just a sum of single particle operators which are these uh, small ages here then the, the n particle operator can be written in this form and this is the non-diagonal form where this, these are the single particle uh, Hamiltonians, the single particle operators, and these are uh, creation and destruction operators, fermions or bosons, bosons doesn't really matter. So this is non-diagonal, so I have small h ij, ci dagger, cj, and I can break this Hamiltonian usually into a diagonal part, plus a non-diagonal part. And this non-diagonal part is just a one-body operator, V, K, J. So I'm creating um, a state, a particle in state K, destroying a particle in state J. So pictorically, this works like this. Sorry. You have this diagram, right? So these particles are interacting. This is a one body potential. So you come in with a state, with a particle in state J, and destroy that particle in state J and create another in state K. And this is essentially mediated by this term VKJ. Now, what if you have two types of identical particles? You have type A and type B, but both, uh, they do not interact in either with each other, not um, nor among themselves. So there's no interaction between the A particles, no interaction between the B particles, on, and no interaction between the A and B particles. All right. So here you now you have non-identical particles. So I, I'm going to draw these lines differently. So these are states for the A particles, these black lines here, and these are states for the B particles. And again, these is, are only uh, one-body terms here, which can be diagonalized. That's one of the assignments today. You can always uh, find a basis where these n-particle Hamiltonians here are diagonal. And these bases is just going to be com linear combinations or a change of bases, if you will. And we'll come back to that. Uh, from the, these operators, you, you're going to build a new set of operators that diagonalize these, these Hamiltonians. Okay, what about interacting identical particles? We have seen that as well, and we notice that the interacting term is, is a bit different. It involves uh, four operators, two destruction operators and two creation operators, and notice the indices. Uh, you, you did this uh, assignment here where you, you show that you know, a two-body operator can be written in this way. And remember that 
index i here is in at the same position as as index uh, as state m. So when you write this integral, i and m are in the same position. Uh, i and k, sorry, are in the same position, and j and m are also in the same position. So that this is how the diagram looks like, right? So you you destroy uh, states particles in states k and m, and you create uh, particles in states i and j. I and k are in the same uh, position in space. J and m also in the same position in the space, and this is the interact interaction between them. Now let's move to the case of non-identical particles, two sets of non-identical particles. So you have one set of A particles, one set of B particles, and let's consider the interaction between the A particles and the B particles. So this is is a case where you have two distinguish, distinguishable particles interacting with each other. So you might think that you know A are electrons and B are positrons or protons, and then uh, you have a system of uh, you know electrons and pos uh, and protons, and you're disconsider disregarding the interaction between the electrons and interaction between the protons, but you're considering the interaction between the electrons and the pr protons. And that's what, what a diagram would like. So this is like the lines for uh, particle A, right? So you're destroying a particle A in state K, creating a particle A in state I, and I and K are in the same position in space. And same for B, you are now destroying a particle B in state M, creating a particle B in state J. J and M will be in the same uh, position in space as well. And then that's how they are interacting. And this is the interacting matrix, if you wish. Right, so this is how it would work for non-identical particles. Another point that's going to be very important in our discussion is what you call fluctuations, fluctuations over the average or the expected value. So let's consider a number operator, which turns out to be non-diagonal. So it's not really a number operator, it's just you know C dagger I C J. So let's call it N I J. Of course if if I and J are the same, this is going to be a number operator. But yeah that's typically what we will have in general, right? For non, a non-diagonal, even for a non-diagonal single particle case, single uh, uh, n particle operator in, in which is just a sum of single particle ones. All right, so let's define what I mean by fluctuation. Remember, uh, to, uh, a few classes ago, we defined the, the thermal average in terms of the density operator. I'll try to remember to put a link here to that class. But we notice that this would be the trace of of rho and times the operator a divided by the trace of rho, which is the density operator, and that can be expanded, say, in a given basis for the n particle states, and you know gives you this the say the canonical partition function and whatnot, and that's what I call the thermal average at non-zero temperature, but at zero temperature, this average is essentially the expected value over the ground state. And we're going to go over this many times over the course. When you talk at t equals zero, we're talking about expected values over the n body, the many body ground state of the system. You can, you can see, I mean, if the temperature goes to zero, then, you know, this beta, which is one over kBT, goes to infinity, this, the, the Boltzmann weight goes to zero except at a ground state where it's maximum, right? It's because this energy would be zero. Uh, and then, yeah, so you all you, that, that you have left is the expected value of the, at the ground state. And that's what you get the, the, the thermal average. So, yeah, for most of the the this class, I'm going to give examples based on the t equals zero case, which is just an expected value over the any and the many body 
ground state. All right, so this is the expected value, the average for any operator, including this one. So we can calculate this, this average. And we're going to define fluctuations above the average and what are the, these fluctuations are. They're defined by subtracting, you know, from an operator, a number, which is, it is its average. And so this will give me an operator, which is essentially this one shift by a, a fixed amount. But this has this interpretation that if I take the average here, right, uh, the average of these fluctuations should be zero. That's the point. And this has, you know, then makes connection with the statistics, if you wish. So these are fluctuations over the average. So you have this average and you have fluctuations around it. Now you can, you can then look at these operator in a different view. You can think of it as a, an average value or a expected value for, for a ground state, for a given state plus fluctuations and these fluctuations will be operators so this is the view that we're going to 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 use in this class so the mean field approach is to try to expand the Hamiltonian in terms of, of these fluctuation operators and keep only the terms which are linear in these operators so let's see how that does that work so let's start with a case of non-identical interacting parts. So you ha we have those particles A and B, right? So let's define these, these uh, number, non-diagonal number operators as N of A, N A, I J is A I dagger A J, meaning that I can define the, the fluctuations in for these operators as uh, delta n a, which is just the operator minus, minus its average value. Same thing for the b particles. So now these fluctuations, fluctuation operators can be expressed in terms of these creation and destruction operators minus their average value. And here the average at equals zero would be over the ground state of the, the system. And at t non equal to zero would be, you know, the trace of the density operator times this, these uh, number operator divided by the, the partition function. So we, we know then how to write these guys in terms of these, these operators here. And the thing is, how, how do we calculate that if, if we don't know the, the ground state yet? So let's leave it for now. This is going to be a, an interesting question later. All right, so we go back to our interacting Hamiltonian. So we have particles A, particles B, and the interaction between A and B. Now, what you want to do is rewrite these Hamiltonians in terms of these guys and averages. So how we do that? So to that, uh, let's go to the, to the blackboard and see that this turns out to be a Hamiltonian that only gets re results in single particle one one body terms so let's see how it works so the crux of the issue here is that interacting term so the other two terms are essentially single particle already so that but that interacting term is is different right because we have uh, something like that so the V between a and B particles, that's the operator, is written I, J, K, and M, if I remember right, as V, I, J, K, and M, A dagger, I, B dagger, J, let's let me just make sure that I'm I'm writing the same. Yeah, so A I B J B M A K. B M A K. All right. Now these are our 
are non-identical particles also they I, they just commute so I can rewrite this is this remember uh, that a and k are in the same position and j and m are in the same position but that's let's that does it does not matter so let's do this then here because they are non identical I can do I can bring this a here close to this one right so I can just uh, keep commuting them uh, they commute and then I do another step and I bring this close to the a and this is not j this is k k right and this, of course then bj equal already written next to bm now this guy is n i k and of type a and this is n j m of type b right and remember what uh the goal here is to write this in, in terms of the the fluctuation so i write n a i k the operator as a average value of expected value say over the ground state which is just a number plus fluctuations and i k same thing for b j m b is an expected value b j m plus delta n b j m and now I reinsert these here and see what happens right so let's re rewrite these operator these interaction in terms of these uh, these guys so I'm, I'm doing nothing just re rewriting everything in terms of these fluctuation operators km v i j k m now I have this is the operator n a which would be the average i k plus delta i k n j m b plus delta n b j m and so this is going to be so now you can you can see that there there's going to be two types of terms here one is going to be uh, quadratic in in the fluctuations and the others are there's going one that's not going to be anything right but there's going to be one which is going to be quadratic in the in the in the fluctuations and another one which is going and other two which are, are going to be linear and one that's going to be just the average time themselves so i'm not going to 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 worry much about that one so let's keep going and and I'll write precisely that. So this is going to be a one, which is going to be the product of the the states. One that's going to be this fluctuation times this expected value, and this fluctuation I'm I'm going to write as this n i k a minus. Uh, J N A I K times N J M B, right? So this times this. Same for the other term. N uh, B J M minus 
expect value of jmb times I'm sorry expected value so let me this might be going over the screen so let's I'm going to continue here uh, yeah there's this bracket here and there's gonna be the term of the fluctuations it's, which is going to be square the fluctuations k delta and b j m so the rule again here is to disregard or essentially not consider this this term here i'm going to neglect that so we're going to throw away these terms which is quadratic in the 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 fluctuations that's that's mean field right so we're just going to consider up to first order in the in the fluctuations like this all right so if i throw that away if i don't neglect that and then rewrite then my operator becomes like this ajkm vijkm open here so there's going to be the product of the averages the expected values oh this j is not too good but let's just keep doing and see what we can get then there's going to be twice the products of the the value so they they will appear again right which is precisely the same term as this okay a and j m b i need to do a better j uh, let's try next time all right but this is just going to be a constant now the, the the interesting part is this n i k Hey, this is an operator times a n an average value j m b plus n uh, j m b the operator times a uh, average value of the operators a i k okay all right now notice that these terms are quad quadratic in fermionic and in creation and destruction operators it's just the, the number operator this non-diagonal number operator times a constant times a con not a constant but a number right so these are one particle again one particle these two so in doing this, and of course this is going to be minus minus the product of the two average values, which is a constant, but let's keep it keep this around, right? So one minus two is minus one, but it's just a number. It's not a constant per se because it's inside this sum here, but it's just a number, it's not doesn't involve any operators here the operator are are average out but these are operators these are one particle states and that's that's the the the, the whole point of naming field approximation so let's go back to the slide okay you, this might be cutting here but this is sum over i j k m right uh, and again this the the these two are one particle one body terms and since i neglected the quadratic terms and fluctuations all i'm left with is one body potential terms and how do i know they're one body well they they just depend on this on these operators in a quadratic form this thing has disappeared it was replaced by these funny products of averages and, and number operators so let's let's take an interpretation of what's going on here by doing those those plots. 
So what I had before was something like that, right? We had this in the interaction term was something like this, and it was connecting the the states via this integral and this this term which is quartic in 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 operators in single particle operators. Now my approximation involves taking this into this, which you might look as a sum of two uh, one-body terms. This one, that's for particles A. So the potential for particles A depends on, on, on the configuration, if you want, of the B particles. So yeah, the interaction between B is kind of hidden in this dependence. It's like the particles A are navigating in, in a single particle potential that is the result of the, an effective result of what particles B are doing interacting with them. So it, it kind of feels it in a, in a way, but in a, in a very average way. It's like the average of what all, all the other B particles are doing. And the same thing for the B particles. So the potential that they are, they're going to be seeing is a one-body potential. So they're going to kind of scatter around. But that's not, you know, that is not uh, accounting for the specific interactions with each of the A particles. But some sort of uh, a general more average value of what the other B particles are doing, right? So the average of N I K. So this, if you... If you sum over IK of this interaction, right? So you summing over the IK here, and you're left with something which has only in the indices J and M. So in a sum, in a sense, the potential that the particles in B B are, are feeling is like an average of all the other the other terms, the, the interactions with the, the the A particles. So that's what you call mean field. It's like the, the the B particles are producing a mean field where these the A particles navigate and scatter off, and the same for the for the for the B, right? Now the question is, well, in order to calculate this average behavior, I need to know the state. But in order to to know the state, I need to solve the problem, and so it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. And let's see how we get around with from of, of that notice that uh, i kept this minus uh, n i k which is I, uh, average values of n a and n b and which is summed over i j k and m with this as a prefactor so this is more like a, a constant value but i'll keep them for just so that we we do not uh we keep the, the count of terms here but let's see, you know, go back to the chicken and egg problem and see how, how we deal with it. All right, so yeah, let's disregard that minus product of the averages here and just write the mean field Hamiltonian now as a single particle, uh, as a non-interacting or one only one body uh, term. So it's a non-interacting Hamiltonian. So there should be a, a knife in here, sorry. But this types of terms, even though it's non-diagonal, is always solvable, meaning that you can always diagonalize it. You can find a basis where this becomes diagonal, right? So this is in the assignment. Uh, you, you're going to show that, that any Hamiltonian with this form can be diagonalized. It's always, you can always solve it. This, in principle, there's, you can always find a single particle spectrum for that, okay? And, and then, the, of course, the n-body ground state and the spectrum. Okay, so that's in quote-unquote easy, solvable. Now, in order to calculate these guys, I need to know the, the average value, the, the, the expected value over the ground state of this, of these operators. So how, so, so that there's the, who came first, the chicken or the egg? So in order to, to find the ground state, I need to diagonalize it. But in order to diagonalize it, I need to know these guys. In order to know these guys, I need to know the, the solution. So you know, how do I get out of the circle? 
So the, the idea is this. All right. Say that you start with an approximation for the ground state. The, you know, can, it can be, you know, the, the ground state for the non-interacting case, for just the, the diagonal case. Doesn't matter. You start with a, the better the, you know, the, the better the approximation, the better off you, you're going to be. But you start off with an approximation for the ground state. So you can calculate, uh, let's go back one. And two here, you can calculate VA, right, from this and VB. All right. Then you plug in here and you have your, your Hamiltonian. And then you solve it, you diagonalize it. And then you, you get the ground state. Perhaps you get not only a ground state, but you get the, the full spectrum and you can have, do finite temperature calculations and so on. But you get the ground state at least. Now, with this new ground state, you go back and calculate the, the, the expected value or the thermal averages if you have the spectrum, right? And you do and redo this calculation. And with that, you go and recalculate these guys, VAIK and VBJM. When you recalculate these guys, you are left with a new Hamiltonian. I mean, it's the same form except that these numbers have changed. And then you re-diagonalize it and get another ground state. Hopefully, you get a better ground state than the previous one. And, and there's another approach here which involves uh, doing this uh, in a self-consistent way but using a variational principle. Uh, we're not going to discuss that in this class, but in principle, uh, if you if you do it in uh, with care, you should you should approach the you know the the solute the ground state solution in uh, at every step. That's when your self consistency loop kind of works or converges, if you wish. And then you do it it again. You recalculate it, recalculate the averages, recalculate the v v a and v b, and recalculate the mean field. And you keep doing that until you, you get some sort of convergence, like the ground state energy converges, so it doesn't change uh, much anymore after iteration, I don't know, uh, 100 or 200 or 1,000. And, you know, everything kind of, kind of sta stabilizes. And you get to the so-called uh, uh, lowest energy solution for your mean field, uh, mean field uh, problem, right? But and in principle, you can you can always do that because it's solvable as long as your approximation is good. And remember, what what is the approximation? Is that you threw away the quadratic terms in terms of the fluctuations. This is it is, is where it gets. Maybe those fluctuations are important, and then your mean field will not work. Will not, or at least will not give uh, reasonable results. But that's another point. Let's let's say that we, you you in principle can do it, right? You can try it at least and see what you get. So that's the way to do it, right? You 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 try to you go over the self consistency loop and you approach the the lowest state and hopefully everything will converge. But the the point here is that you, you transformed a interacting problem in a single particle one, in a, in a one body problem by doing this mean field approximation. Okay, so let's go now to the another case where you have only identical particles. Now you have only one type of particles and they're interacting with each other. Now you do the same the same thing, right? You write, rewrite these operators in terms of their fluctuating part and their average part. And now the Hamiltonian notice that involves only operators of one kind. Remember that I and M now are, uh, I and K are in the same uh, position, right? And J and M are also in the same position. This, uh, I'm going to stress that this, because this is going to be very important. Now these can be fermionic or bosonic operators, so 
Now things will, will be a little bit more complicated than, than the previous case. So one important result that we're going to discuss and it is going to appear later so I'd like to, to take some time to, to discuss it here is this. Say you take the expected value of the whole thing right over say the ground state or one at the mean field level you calculate the ground state is going to be a non-interacting uh, n particle ground state because n mean field is just independent particles but but this this is my work for the more general case as we shall see later but let's let's restrict that to an expected value over an n uh, particle non-interacting state. What it turns out to be is that this four operator average can be broken into a sum of the products products of two operator averages, right? C C I dagger C J dagger C M C K is can be written is this is going to be equal to C I CK average times CJCM average plus or minus and this plus or minus depending depending on whether you have bosons or fermions CICM and CJCK right so this is going to be the the the, the important thing here so these are excitation values over mean field states or non-interacting states so let, let's see uh, let's argue for or give an example of how this comes about. We're, we're not going to do a strict proof here, but at least you argue that you you can think of this as as something that makes sense and you can actually sc sketch the proof from from what we're going to do. So let's let's go to the blackboard. So the statement works more or less like this. Say I have an expected value of operators 1, 2, 3, and 4, each creating a particle in one of these states. And the thing we want to prove or show, at least argue, is that this works like this. C1, C4, times C2, C3, plus or less C1, C3, C2, C4, right? So that's uh, what we had here, C1 you know, and 4, 2 and 3, 1 and 3, 2 and 4, okay. All right, so uh, I'd like to have an example, or let's consider first this to be at t equals zero. So this is essentially the expected value over a ground state. And uh, let's try to, to, to see what would be the, the typical properties of the, this ground state that would have something that's non-zero. Everything here is non-zero, right? Because, yeah, sure, if everything is zeros, then this should be zero too. Like, if I create C4 and C3 and try to destroy a, a state 4 in, in, my, in my ground state and the zero, this, this will automatically be zero. But let, let's try to, to find a way where none of these four terms is zero here. So this one is actually gives me a number, which I'll call A. This gives me a number, which I call B, it can be a complex number, but it's okay. And this gives me a number, which I call C, and this can be a number, which I call D. These are all uh, complex numbers, right? Right? All right. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, how do I do I go about this and try to, to formulate a simple example where this thing works precisely as this? That okay. It's, the first point is you can realize that, uh, for instance, if uh, uh, I have to 
you know, be able to destroy a particle in state one and destroy a particle in state two on this on this state, right? I'd like to have this, which is, of course, C1 Niagara different than zero. And I'd like to have this, which is, of course, C2 Niagara different than zero, right? I'd like to have that, Other, because Otherwise, I'd get zeros here, right? If these guys are zero, then everything here is zero. All right. So let's, for an example, take that uh, n1 applied in phi equals 1. So, so you have one particle of type 1 there and one type of particle, uh, and one particle of type 2 there right so meaning that uh in one equals one and, and two well let's let's write it like this let's write it like this that So that's the first first assumption of over my first assumption assumption right that this so that these are I know that at least these are these are non zero because of one and two now i I want you know the off diagonal one and four and two and three average applied over over this guy to be non zero. So the second thing I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, I'd like to have then operator C3 and C4 be a combination of C1 and C2 like this. Say that I have C3 to be, uh, let's say C3 equals C, this C here, this C here times C1. These are operators, so I'll put a little hat here. And let's say B times C2, right? Just a combination of operators. And I have C4 equals what? A, uh, C1, plus D, C2. That's my second assumption. All right. And why do I choose it like this? Because if I, by doing that, I will know that first, if I do, uh, <clears throat> C1, C3, this is going to give me B. If I do C1, oops, C4, this is going to give me A. Why is that? Well, remember this state, right, let's and, and, and the others too, right? Uh, all the all the others are going to to give me the correct one. So like C two, C three is going to give me. Sorry, this is C. Uh, sorry, it's C. And this is D B. C1, C3 is B, C1, C4 is A, C1, C3 is C, all right? And last but not least, we have C2, C4 is D. So this implies this. How, for instance, example, pick one. Let's take this one, right? 
So C4 psi equals A C1 psi plus D C2 psi, right? Just by this definition. Now I'm going to apply C1 here. C1, C1. And then I'm going to close it. Take the expected value with C1, C1, C4. This is going to be uh, C1, C1 plus D, C1, C2, right? Well, this one definitely is, is, should be zero. Why? Because this will, is going to take to a state which is orthogonal to, to psi, and this is not gonna, going to recover because this is going to be proportional to a state with n2 minus one, and n1 equals one. n2 equals zero, actually and 2 equals 0 because remember I, first assumption is that I have only one particle of type 2 in Psi so I destroy one I get 0 and once I create this is going to, to go to n2 equals 0 n1 equals 2 so it's definitely orthogonal to to my my state Psi which by first assumption has is uh, well, proportional to when 1 equals 1 and 2 equals 1. Of course, it can be a combination with other states, but all of them have to be n1 equals 1. So it's a particular state, but, you know, it works. All right, so this one is 0, 0, and this one is, of course, 1, right? Because this is 1, so I get a and this checks. You can do the same for, for the other ones. So these are my, my constructions. All right, so I get, I, I know from this construction, but that none of my, uh, the terms here in the right hand side is going to be zero. They are all going to be complex numbers by, and given by this, right? Given this by, by these guys. All right. Now let's calculate then this. C1, C2, C3, C4, right? Okay, so let's start with this. Let's start with C4 applied to Psi. This is going to be then Psi, C1, C2, C3, and then here is going to be A, C1, Psi plus D C2 Psi. Okay, so I have two terms there. I have one term like this C3 C1 Psi. There is going to be an A here multiplying. Let's write an A here. Okay plus a d times c1, c2, c3, c2. You, you, this might be cutting, so sorry if, if it is cutting, but uh, uh, okay. So I'm, I'm trying to, to write a little bit down here. Okay, so next step is to to try to get number operators of 1 and 2 here. So I, I need to, to get this guy close to this one so that I can act with a number operator C1 dagger C1 into Psi, which I should be get just Psi, right? So in order to do that, I have to, to replace with this guy. So remember, uh, uh, these are our bosons or fermions. So if I switch two operators, if they're fermions, I get a minus one. If they're bosons, I get a plus one. 
But if I switch twice, this one with this one, this one with this one, I should get a plus one, even if they're fermions, because and the, notice they're all different, so there's nothing here. And in terms of, you know, uh, operators with, with the same index, so they're all different index by construction. So if I uh, jump it twice, if I switch this with this, and then again with one and three, I should get a plus one, even if they're fermions. So, oh, sorry. The end result is that this should be equal to psi c2 dagger c3. So I, I went from here to here, and now this one shifts to the left, and I get this. Now, if you didn't get it, I, I suggest you, you do it calmly because this is the sort of thing we're going to do many, many times over the course, right? Uh, try to to bring these things together here to, to try to evaluate expected values that we know. All right. Now, the other one is trickier because, see, I have a 2 here. And I want to bring these two dagger, C2 dagger, close to the C2. So then I can apply the number operator and 2 to, to Psi that I can solve. Now, here I only have one jump. Now, if they're fermions, I should, if they're bosons, I should get a plus one. If they're fermions, I should get a minus one. So here I'll get plus or minus if they're bosons and minus if they're fermions. Times what? Now I have the psi C one c3 c2 dagger c2 next to the side which is precisely what i want to okay let's move on then this thing should be of course equals to psi because by the, our first assumption up there remember is that uh n1 times size equals psi all right so this gives me A times Psi C2, C3, Psi, plus or minus D. Now this guy is also Psi because by assumption there's only one particle with of state 2 in Psi. So this should be Psi C1, C3, Psi, and the expected value of C2 dagger C3 is B, right? So this is equal to A times B, and the expected value of C1 and C3 is C. C times D which well completes our proof or uh, well, not not a proof but at least that for this case it works but you know we essentially we got exactly what we want we we show that this is ab minus plus or minus c times d now you might you might say oh well what if the number of you know, ones in in size not equal to 1 is something else or same for two. Yeah, you, you you can you can do that. Go ahead and do it. The calculation is a lot longer, but you're going to end up with the same result. Uh, that that I assure you. So and well, if if you if you end up with a different result for bosons or fermions, then well, you should drop everything you're doing and write a paper because this is going to be an important result. Uh, then we, we can discuss it. But this should work. Is actually we're going to to go over this later in the course, and this sort of pairing terms of you know decomposing this in terms of these contractions of two operators, the sum of contractions. This actually works for many many more operators too. Is at the heart of Wick's theorem theorem that we're going to to cover. So yeah, this is a, is an important result.
So let's go back to the slide. All right. So let's continue and, and try to use this result to derive the mean field equations for the for this problem of identical interacting particles. So, so we have these interacting identical particles and we want to write this potential in terms of a mean field. And we're going to the blackboard to show it, but it turns out that this will have two terms. And uh, we're going to discuss that, we can, can do that, but there's going to be uh, one term which we call the density density uh, term or hard tree, and the other which comes from the exchange. This hard tree fog language is more common in, in the language of fermions, but it can be used in, in the for bosons as well. And uh, uh, well, for bosons, it's it, this is should not be called a fog term is but this is more for fairness the, the exchange terms but the same mean field can be used for for bosons but for fermions this the the nomenclature is correct hard tree fog okay so let's see how we get this out of this interactive potential okay so let's start with that identity that uh, <clears throat> I showed you ci cj cm ck this is a dagger here which is precisely the term in the potential c i c k c j c m plus plus or minus c i c m um c j c k all right now our interacting term is something like this i j k m v i j k m c i c j c m c k now and this of course is valid for mean field and I'm going to argue that since in mean field we're going to always use these expected values, that the approximation to mean field is that I take this as a property over the operators themselves. Okay, so at mean field, this would be something like this. I J K M C I C K C J C M Oh there is the V I J K M here multiplying everybody, right? plus or minus C I C M uh, hopefully I'm not getting to the border to the edge of the screen here C K it's hopefully this this you should still hear that but this is this is the important part meaning that in mean field my Hamiltonian can be written as this I J K M these non-diagonal numbers operator N I K and J M well, well there's a this V I J K M here plus or minus N I M N J K all right. Remember, this is over single particles. So, in principle, if I'm writing a, in, in terms of a single particle and Hamiltonian, this should this should work. All right. And now I do the same trick as I did before. So, and I K 
or any of them I write in terms of an average value plus a fluctuation and I disregard the fluctuations the, the terms in second order in, in fluctuations so uh, from this uh, you can you can already see that okay let's try to write the whole thing here it's gonna take a while but it's worth it V I J K M you already see it I'm, I'm gonna have two terms right two terms which uh, will be very similar to those from from the other case that we had but this will have a term that you know it's going to be uh, the linear in in the in in this uh, fluctuations. So uh, there's going to be the fluctuation over i k. Well, yeah. Well, let's let's do that. Fluctuation over i k, which is average minus n i k fluctuation of ik times the average value of jm plus fluctuation of jm times average value of ik uh, plus average value of IK, average value of JM, all right, okay, that's one term, plus the, the one that's second order in, in uh, fluctuations, which I'm going to uh, IK, and this is JM, which I'm going to neglect here right but it should be there and so this is one term oh sorry notice that i and k are in the same position right j and m as well so this is like the uh, a density if you wish but then there, there's going to be the, the other term which is going to be uh, plus or minus same V I K M right remember a K, I and K J and M and this one comes from the second which is same thing there but fluctuation in I M so I and M are in different positions in space keep that in mind I M times uh, average of JK plus fluctuations in JK average does uh, sorry yeah here is fluctuations so this, uh, it's bad okay fluctuations in JK Oh, um, fluctuations, of course, is uh, is the this plus. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. And the, this is plus. Yes. Okay. Hopefully, yeah. This is minus plus minus plus. Yeah, it's, of course operator times minus the average times I M plus I M J K and there is the second order term there that I'm going to neglect all right so let's keep going this is I J K M V I J K M first term yeah let's do it like this there is going to be minus two 
plus 1, there's going to be minus 1, but there's going to be 1 ik times n j m plus n j m times n i k minus, right, there's this uh, minus 2 plus 1 minus the product of the average values j m and here plus or minus v i j k m something similar oh, sorry but it's going to be n i m n j k plus n uh, jk and uh, i m minus n i m and jk okay now again i have to stress this this has a particle phi i in r1 and a particle uh, phi m at r2 right something like that here i'm talking then of a density this is going to be proportional to phi i r phi k r1 is going to be something a density uh, a number or a number if you want at the same position and here so this is called direct and this is going to be uh, at a density which is kind of a different positions meaning that would be something like this i at r1 phi m at r2 so this if i write this in terms of the operators in 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 real space is going to be something that's kind of known local right you have one part in in one position and the other in the in the other one while this one is local so uh for those who work with the dft so this at, at the heart of the exchange this is the local density approximation and this would be some sort of exchange which is kind of non-local so this would be the for fermions this would be the Fock term and this would be the heart rate term heart rate term so that that's ex related to exchange of, of, of the particles okay so let's go back to the slide okay so just to wrap up uh, this is the result and in order to solve this you should proceed pretty much like in the previous case you'd have this those that cycle of uh, self-consistency you have to start with a guess for the ground state or you know the spectrum say for the non-interacting case and keep doing uh, calculating the one body terms which would be just the sum say over i and uh, over j and m sorry j and m of this guy times this expected value same thing here and then you know you get one body terms for both the 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 direct and the exchange term and then you you do the loop recalculate the ground state recalculate the one body potentials and, and so on so that's the the heart of the mean field approximation for identical interacting particles so that's that's it I'm, I'm probably going to to go over a few examples for the electron gas and and later but let's see uh, I, I want to to finish up with uh, a more uh, general idea of what we're throwing away when you do mean field 
So the question is, what are we throwing away when you, we do this mean field approximation? I mean, we're throwing away yeah, those quadratic terms and fluctuations, right? But what, what does that mean? Okay. Uh, in one word, we're throwing away correlations. That's precisely, I mean, in the, in the, in the statistical definition of correlations. We're, that's what we're doing. So, say, if you have two variables, right? And, and this is basic statistics. The correlation function between, say, variable x and variable y is the expected value of the product x and y minus the product of the averages of x and y over a given distribution, right? This is correlation. If this thing is zero, it means that these variables are uncorrelated. They're completely statistically independent, meaning that you know the, av the product of the averages is equal to the average of the product. So completely uncorrelated variables. Now, uh, so this is a real measure of correlations, right? And here, remember what we did for for our our the case where you have two uh, non-identical particles uh, interacting. What we did is was in effect to replace this uh, average of these num these number operators and i and ak by their the product of their, their averages and at the end of the day that's precisely what he did we we did this we we approximate the the, the average of the product by the product of the averages uh, in the case for identical particles was not as much because we kept some sort of correlations uh, in the information of the exchange of the particles. So there's this special type of correlations there, I mean, for the exchange, but for the interactions, that was thrown away as well. So here in mean field, when we, we reduce the interacting problem to a single particle one, we're saying approximation, we're essentially approximating that the, the particles are not correlate, correlated. They, they are independent of each other. I mean, the potential that they see really depends on the position of the others and etc. But if you calculate the correlations between part, the occupations of particles N and B, they are essentially uncorrelated. And this is a very, very important point. So it's okay to do mean field, but you have to, to know that you're throwing away correlations. And in many cases, correlations are the heart of the problem. They are what drive the problem to their their properties and they they cannot be thrown away lightly so you can do that as a first approximation to see you know phases we, we might discuss uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking that is capturing mean field but you have to do it knowing that you're throwing away correlations okay so that's it for today's class i'll see you in the next class bye bye